20 Democratic presidential candidates debated over two nights in Detroit, Michigan. But was there a clear winner to take on President Donald Trump in the 2020 election? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu, and this is The Heat. There was a lot on the line this week for U.S. Democratic candidates vying to get their platforms heard on a national stage. Democratic rivals challenged each other on a number of policies, from health care to immigration and criminal justice reform. The only thing the candidates seem to agree on is their desire to defeat the current president. We have someone who passed a so-called trade policy that was trade policy by tweet and has resulted in attacks on American families. So we must defeat him. And, and the reason we are going to defeat Trump and beat him badly is that he is a fraud and a phony and we're going to expose him for what he is. In the face of cruelty and fear from a lawless president, we will choose to be the nation that stands up for the human rights of everyone. On January 20th, 2021, we'll say together, adios to Donald Trump. So Mr. President, let's get something straight. We love it. We are not leaving it. We are here to stay, and we're certainly not going to leave it to you. Well, for more now on the Democratic presidential debates, let's bring in our panel. Joining us in the studio is Rashida Thomas. She's the principal and co-founder of RC Communications, a public relations firm. Also with us is Joel Rubin. He's a Democratic strategist and the president of the Washington Strategy Group. From Dallas, Texas, Merrill Matthews is a resident scholar with the Institute for Policy Innovation. And Rafael Bernal is a staff writer with the U.S. political newspaper, The Hill. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Joel, let's start right here in the studio with you. Two nights in Detroit, 20 candidates, 10 each night. Uh, what were your main impressions? Well, first and foremost, I take all 20 over Donald Trump. So I want to start with that. Uh, but the debates seemed to chip away at some of the front runners, and they were in a defensive crouch. Certainly last night, uh, Vice President Biden was. On the flip side, in the first night, what was interesting is that the progressives, the leaders of the progressive movement, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, they were at the center. It used to be in reverse. It used to be that the progressives would argue hard against uh, the middle of the road. Now it's in reverse, where the middle, the moderates, they're saying to the progressives, you're wrong, knowing that the progressives are in the lead. So this, this is not sorted out yet. And who can defeat Donald Trump is not clear, but certainly the party looks like it's heading in a more progressive direction. And the party also looks like a very diverse party, doesn't it? Extremely diverse, yeah. and that's a good thing, and that's healthy for our democracy overall. It brings people into the process, and it's necessary to win because we're going to have to turn out votes en masse in the cities and with minorities significantly across the country. And then, of course, this is the big question is, who can bring out the white working class vote, quite frankly, in the Midwest? Who's going to flip those seats? That's why the jousting is so intense right now. Yeah, those are important states. Rashida, let's talk about race uh, and the race issue in this presidential contest. It's not the first time, of course, that race is an issue in a presidential contest, but it's out there right now. And here is Senator Kamala Harris confronting former President Joe Biden on the issue of busing or racially integrating schools. Let's watch this. When Vice President Biden was in the United States Senate working with segregationists to oppose busing, which was the vehicle by which we would integrate America's public schools, had I been in the United States Senate at that time, I would have been completely on the other side of the aisle. And let's be clear about this. Had those segregationists their way, I would not be a member of the United States Senate, Cory Booker would not be a member of the United States Senate, and Barack Obama would not have been in the position to nominate him to the title he now holds. When Senator Harris was the Attorney General for eight years in the state of California, there were two of the most segregated school districts in the country, in Los Angeles and in San Francisco. And she did not, I, I didn't see a single solitary time she brought a case against them. To so, Rashida, how big an issue is race in this election? And really, does Vice President or former Vice President Joe Biden, does he have to do a better job of addressing his past? Well, I think that um, work Senator Harris is hitting him is uh, something that happens uh, 30 years ago and not something that has happened in his recent career. 
I thought what was interesting last night is that Joe Biden was ready for her. She actually didn't seem ready for the busing question. The busing question made her the star of last debate. You know, it catapulted her to the big kids table and, you know, she skyrocketed in the polls. So it was interesting to see that not only was she not interested for that question, um, she seemed a little bit hesitant to respond, not as forceful as she was in the first election. I thought that, uh, that Biden handled it pretty well. Um, and it was also interesting to me that when later on Gabbard attacked her on her record, right. she had no real response. But when you say it was something that Biden uh, said or did 30 years ago, is it still not relevant today? It is. And he has to address it. And I think that he has um, several times, um, not only in the last debate and last night, but also in the media. Um, but I think that she's going to, if she, I don't think she wants to make this about race with him. Um, but I think that if she would like to, she's going to have to come with something a little bit stronger than that. Rafael, another big issue, uh, listening to uh, people uh, on the stage, there was immigration. As we are aware, the Trump administration has taken a very harsh line uh, on Central American immigrants at the southern border. We've seen these pictures, heard the stories of children being taken away from their parents, overcrowded detention centers, ICE agents going after people, raiding their homes. Here is what the candidate said on those who are crossing the border. The fact of the matter is you should be able to, if you cross the border illegally, you should be able to be sent back. It's a crime. The biggest problem right now that we have with immigration it's Donald Trump. He's using immigration to not only rip apart families, but rip apart this country. I've been down to the border. I have seen the mothers. I have seen the cages of babies. We must be a country that every day lives our values. If a mother and a child walk thousands of miles on a dangerous path, in my view, they are not criminals. These are very diverse views, aren't they? There's no coherent policy as far as the Democrats are concerned on uh, immigration. Well, in general, that's, that has been the problem with Democrats. They, they, don't know, they don't know what they don't know on immigration. Mm -hmm. um, Republicans have been a lot more cohesive uh, as of late, uh, definitely moving toward the right, toward the, uh, the, the Trumpian view of immigration. One thing that you do see, that you did see in, in, in both these panels, you, you had the people who really are experts on immigration. You had uh, Julian Castro really knows his stuff on immigration. Beto O'Rourke knows his stuff on immigration. Elizabeth Warren has done her homework. Cory Booker. And they're not the loudest on immigration. And, and I think that, that, would, that shows a weakness for, uh, for the Democrats because they ended up having an argument that's essentially they were very quick to call out Republican talking points and questions about health care. They weren't very quick to call, call out Republican talking points and questions about immigration. And, and they're really talking about, like, if, if you let more people in or if you respect the human rights of people who come in, how many more are going to come in? <laughs> and that is essentially, that is the core Republican talking point. And what people on the left who know about immigration really fight against and really talk about, no, people come here out of desperation a little bit of what Senator Sanders was saying is more, more attuned with, with progressive thought right. on, on immigration. The fact that they're not talking about and not being as forthcoming uh, on the immigration issue, is that going to hurt them in the election, do you think? It could hurt them in specific states. It could hurt them in winning Arizona. And it might hurt them in there's like, it's states where there's slivers of, of very immigrant-heavy communities. Right. And, and you're talking places like Georgia. You're talking Pennsylvania where this 2% sliver might push it red or push it blue. And, and, and it could hurt them if people don't come out to vote because they don't feel represented or they don't feel that they will be protected against the Trumpian view of immigration. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they don't vote for the Democratic candidate and Trump has a, could have a repeat win much along the same path as he had his win in 2016. Okay, Joel? Yeah, I, this is a, a great example and a great point. It, the, right now, the Democratic Party is in a completely different place on immigration yeah. than we were even four years ago. And now we're watching in these debates Barack Obama being portrayed as the deporter in chief. Right. Right. Now, that is a significant departure. So, from a nominee perspective, it makes sense to pander to that kind of position, yeah. but that is a very dangerous, risky strategy for a general election. So that's why I see Joe Biden yeah. essentially being very careful about how he talks about it. But 
immigration issues are a highly motivating issue right now for Democrats. Okay, let's go to Dallas and bring in Merrill Matthews. Merrill uh, just talked about Joe Biden. He's leading the Democrat uh, PAC uh, as far as the uh, opinion polls are concerned. In fact, the Quinnipiac poll has Biden with 34% support among Democrats. Uh, but let's look at it from the Republican view. Which candidate, in your view, poses the biggest threat to Donald Trump? You know, I, that's hard to say. My guess is Joe Biden, because he is a little bit more moderate. I still think many Democrats are more on the moderate side and haven't sort of bought into the far left proposal that uh, is expressed by so many of the Democratic presidential candidates. Having said that, that's where the energy is, is on the, uh, uh, the far left side. So it's just, it's not clear to me right now who ultimately wins this. I think Joe Biden came in the leader. I think he did well last night, uh, especially compared to the debates last month, and, uh, and uh, remained the leader there. And he's trying to run a bit of a moderate proposal there, especially on health care. And I think that probably will work well for some Democrats. He's got to keep some Democrats in his uh, camp because, my goodness, they did, the country is just not as far left as Bernie Sanders. Yeah, I have heard that argument. He may, he may not be as strong in the debates, but he is probably the only candidate on that stage who's able to attract that broad range of support from moderates all the way through to progressives. Well, I think that's right. And, and I think he's trying to sort of thread that needle, for instance, on, the, uh, on, on Obamacare. He has a, it, it, it's a difficult position for him. President Obama passed Obamacare. Joe Biden was his vice president. He can't come out and trash that. So he's got to talk about building on that. The irony here is all the candidates agreed that the current health care system is an absolute mess, dysfunctional, costs too much, not enough access, though that's Obamacare. That's the system that they gave us. Joel, the thing that we heard uh, during the debate, we hear a number of these very ambitious, bold programs, uh, plans of action, Medicare for all, uh, free college tuition. Yeah. They're going to even give $1,000 to everybody in the country <laughs> every month, uh, basic universal income. basic yeah. income. But Can I have listen. mine now? <laughs> let's listen to what some of the candidates had to say. I think Democrats win when we run on real solutions, not impossible promises. When we run on things that are workable, not fairy tale economics. I don't understand why anybody goes to all the trouble of running for president of the United States just to talk about what we really can't do and shouldn't fight for. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren makes a great point there, but uh, do any of these grandiose plans have a chance of getting through the U.S. Congress? They don't have a chance of getting through in their original form, but they do really matter for laying out a vision of what that person wants to achieve as president. You have to have a vision for why you want the office. So in that case, Elizabeth Warren was right. John Delaney was right also in that it probably isn't going to look like like she, like what she's advocating for. But if you don't have a vision and if it's not inspiring, you're not going to motivate voters and you're not going to be able to clarify ultimately in the general what is different between you, the Democrat, and Donald Trump. Rashida, Joe Biden has been taking a lot of heat for his record, especially on race issues, about his role in the, uh, the Omnibus Crime Bill, which was passed in the 90s. Um, we heard um, um, Kamala Harris take him on as well on busing. Uh, so he's got a record there. But how does that explain his pretty high support among African Americans? Well, he was Barack, he was our first black president's vice president yeah. for eight years. And not only was he his vice president, they're friends. They call each other family. Their kids spend time together. Um, their the wives, Michelle and, and Jill, are genuine friends in vacation together. Mm -hmm. um, the optics for him are amazing when it comes to um, his relationship with Barack Obama. And I think that that can't, it can't, it obviously helps him. Um, last night he got a lot of flack for piggyback, piggybacking on Obama's record. And how could he not? I mean, why, why wouldn't he? And as Joel said, I think he wouldn't trash him. I mean, it would be stupid for him to trash him. But he could only benefit from attaching himself from such a wonderful legacy and from such a celebrated president. Rafael, uh, looking at all the candidates over the last two nights, did, did any uh, front runners emerge who could, you know, it's a question I put to, uh, to Merrill, that could attract the broad spectrum of people racially and ideologically in the country? 
I think they they all can to a certain extent. The the one thing that seems sort of an odd exercise about this last round of debates is we know who's going to be on the on the stage in September for the next round. And most of these 20 people are not going to be there. You have the top four, of course, Biden, Harris, uh, Warren, and Sanders are definitely going to be there. O'Rourke is in, Buttigieg is in, and Castro Booker and Klobuchar have a, have a shot, and Yang have a, a shot. The rest of them, they're gone. So. Can any of these people bring in the Democratic Big Tent? I, I believe they all can. And you, you saw, but, but you saw Democrats focusing the first night on their policy differences, showing that there is a difference between the, the moderate wing of the party and, and the progressive wing of, of the party. And then the second night, just focusing on their political differences, right. showing how they can play whack-a-mole with each other. Yeah. I don't think that all of them have a chance of bringing the party under the tent. I, I disagree with you there. And speaking from, I'm a native South Carolinian, and looking through the lens of a Southern Christian woman who knows uh, the, the mentality of Southerners, and um, especially white Southerners, I, in this Trump America, I think that we really need to take into account what, um, what people outside of this nice blue bubble that we live in in Washington, how they think. And um, I think that's why Joe Biden is the front runner. And I think that he has the best chance of being the nominee just because of electability one and because of mass appeal. I can only assume you mean Bernie would have the most trouble getting, getting that, that big tent. And you're probably right, but- Or he, Warren. Warren, I'm, I'm not so sure about Warren. She's, do, she's doing, she's running a great campaign, which, mm -hmm. which in 2016 we learned that running a great campaign is a big part of winning, mm -hmm. um, which should have been obvious to, in, in, mm -hmm. in <laughs> retrospect, right? Yeah. But I, th I think even Bernie's doing a, a very big exercise in getting his ground game running. And that's where, where a lot of presidential candidates have failed, is not having a ground game. And that's something that they're all learning. So I, I think this campaign is gonna be different from anything we've ever seen. But this, this is yeah, also you know what, why what, Biden, I'll get to you, Meryl. Go ahead. Well, this is why Biden is, <laughs> is uh, seen as the leader in this field, because he has 50 years of experience and public knowledge. The public knows him for 50 years. He doesn't have to reintroduce himself to the American people. He doesn't have to go too far to the left to win the nomination. If he can just win the nomination, he'll be fine. He can play it cool yep. because he has this reservoir of knowledge. His name ID is astronomical. And that is why he continues to see high numbers in the polls. Also has 50 years of record that people can attack And him that on. makes it and hard in that's debate. A it does. Double edged yes. sword, absolutely. Right. Uh, Merrill, go ahead. But, but Ramirez, he, Biden is a compromised candidate here. It, it, the, what's interesting about this is nobody seems to be generating the kind of excitement that Barack Obama did. Uh, when he first ran in 2008, I mean, he really became sort of the the ideal candidate for Democrats, and he and everybody gravitated to him, even bypassing uh, Hillary Clinton, who people sort of thought this person's going to win, mm -hmm. and Barack Obama was able just to sort of draw that consensus and the ideal and the aspirations of the Democrats, and and there's really not somebody here. Joe Biden may win the Democratic nomination, but it's a compromise. It's not because he's everybody's ideal. Right. Merrill, if you look at the Democrat field, there are uh, pretty wide ideological differences among the candidates, especially yeah. on issues like uh, immigration, uh, health care. Um, some of them have been called socialists, which in certain cases is considered a political liability. Um, do you see some, of them, uh, some of them embrace the name, though. Right, right. <laughs> but do you see President Trump exploiting those divisions? Oh, I think he's going to try to significantly because the country historically has just not embraced socialism, has sort of repelled against it. So to the extent that the President Trump can uh, tag the socialist moniker on the candidates, if it were Bernie Sanders, he would, uh, he would embrace it. Uh, I think that sort of repels an awful lot of middle America, and that's the people that Trump needs to win, especially in the flyover states. Joel, uh, President Trump, of course, has been tweeting about the debates. This is what he had to say. He said China, Iran, and other foreign countries are looking at the Democrat candidates and, uh, quote, drooling over the small prospect that they could be dealing with them in the not-too-distant future. They would be able to rip out, beloved, uh, rip off our beloved uh, USA like never before with President Trump. No way. 
I mean, what do you make from that? And this is coming from a president who's got no real significant mm -hmm. foreign policy ach achievements to talk about. Right. This is coming from a guy who's figured out how to self-isolate the United States yeah. on Iran, encourage them to restart their nuclear program, yeah. uh, decimate the domestic economy through uh, nonsensical tariffs. So uh, he should not be advising anyone on national security. And I think Democrats are smart to stay away from uh, his views. But it was disappointing last night, I will say. There was not much national security discussion. Maybe 8% of the airtime went to foreign policy. Democrats have a strong vision. Democrats want to promote diplomacy, want to engage multilaterally, want to use smart power. Hopefully that will come out in the future, but last night it wasn't really there. So Trump, he does get to, to throw those bars, but he doesn't have much to crow about. But national security, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a different view on that. If you listen to the Democrats and their position, almost all of them were concerned about China. Almost all of them said they would take something of a different track, trying to go back to the Trans-Pacific Partnership or something of that nature. But they pretty much mirrored, even if, if less accentuated, a number of Donald Trump's concerns that he was sort of instrumental in raising. No, it, Donald Trump actually has, has brought up concerns that were longtime Democratic concerns and figured out how to mess them up. Th that's right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Rashida, several Democrats, of course, went after Joe Biden during the debate uh, on Wednesday night. Let's uh, look at some of them. First of all, Mr. Vice President, it looks like one of us has learned the lessons of the past and one of us hasn't. Let me begin by telling you. Mr. Vice President, you can't have it both ways. You invoke uh, President Obama more than anybody in this campaign. You can't do it when it's convenient right. and then dodge it when it's not. Why did you announce in the first day a zero tolerance policy of stop and frisk and hire Rudy Giuliani's guy in 2007 when I was trying to get rid of the crack cocaine. Uh, Mr. Vice President, there's a saying in my community, you're dipping into the Kool-Aid and you don't even know the flavor. Uh, you, need to, you need to come to the city of Newark. I think it was President Obama who said that you've got to be really careful you don't get into a circular firing squad. Uh, are the Democrats risking that right now with this uh, criticism of uh, Joe Biden? Well, not only were they criticizing Joe Biden last night, but they were criticizing Obama's record, which I think is extremely dangerous. Um, it's really difficult to watch Democrats eat each other. They're they're known for um, for party cannibalism, and it's been difficult to uh, to watch, especially last night. Um, I thought that the clip of Castro just reminded me that I thought that his his showing last night was actually quite strong. Um, Booker. Um, Conversely, had that weird in my community. We have this Kool-Aid saying is just false. And are you and not familiar with it? I mean, it's about 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of like my dad trying to be cool and say on fleek or something. It was terrible. <laughs> uh, Merrill Matthews, staying with President Trump, he's now threatening China with more trade tariffs. On Thursday, he yeah. said he would impose 10% uh, tariffs on another 300 billion dollars worth of Chinese goods and those tariffs would come into effect on September 1st. Um, how do you think this trade war with China will feature in this election? Oh, geez, it is, uh, th that, those, those tariffs seem to come out of the blue. The White House statement yesterday was that they had some, they made some progress, uh, that China was gonna buy some more agricultural products, they were gonna meet in September, and then the tariffs come. And it's, I, I think the president wants to try to make China a bogeyman as a way to sort of rally around him. Uh, and it's just, it, it, it seems to me it, it, it has worked to some extent but at some point, Mr. President, you're wanting to try to, uh, to emphasize your fact of being able to create deals, and you're not getting any deals on the foreign policy issues, whether you're talking about North Korea, China, and the others. They just haven't, uh, you just haven't been able to seal the deal on anything just yet, and I think that actually hurts them a little bit. Is there a risk, uh, Merrill, that uh, this trade war with China could backfire on the president? I mean, if you look at some of the comments coming out of uh, Midwestern farmers right now, uh, they're not exactly supporting the president on this. Oh, I, I think that's absolutely right. And you may have someone like Senator Chuck Grassley introduce legislation which will pull the, which will claw back this ability to be able to impose tariffs at will on the president. He might veto that, but you're getting a lot more resistance in the, in the president's ability to be able to do these willy-nilly because he seems to use them at a, at a whim rather than strategically or uh, in, con in Congress with, uh, with Congress. 
Rafael, the next debate is about six weeks away. That will take place in Houston in uh, Texas. Uh, right now we have 20 candidates, or more than 20 candidates, fighting for the nomination. At what stage are we going to start seeing candidates drop off? Well, they're going to drop off after that debate in September. They're, they're, when, when they don't show up on stage, that's, that's it for them. You know, they, they, this, is, this is the moment where they have to show themselves to the American people. And that September debate, just being in it, already makes people tough contenders. And that's very important. But there are some that will probably go into next year. Uh, we have to remember that the primary calendar is a lot different from other years. California is very early. So you could, you could see a bump for somebody that's more progressive or has different views on immigration come out of that at that same. So Super Tuesday, I think this, well, next year, actually, you know, 2019 went away. And we're already in 2020. Super Tuesday is going to be hugely important. It's actually that's when a whole load of states uh, uh, even more important than the past. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be Texas, California, Virginia, Massachusetts, like you name it, it's in there. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, it's probably done by then. Right. It, it's also the amount of money that these candidates will be receiving yes. that'll fall away as well. Well, they, they're. Their fundraising has been up and up and down. You have people like uh, Elizabeth Warren. She's she's on an upward track. Uh, Beto O'Rourke. He had a very big war chest. It's diminishing, but September is probably going to give him a little bit of a boost because because you start concentrating uh, the, the the amount of donors and a smaller amount of candidates, and I think money won't be that big of a factor right. after September, but for the long run it will be. Uh, Joel. Uh, looking at the front runners, what will they be now looking at? To take someone like Joe Biden, what would he be looking at? Uh, yeah, r right now it's getting their ground game going mm -hmm. properly because these primaries are going to be so close and it's going to be about turning out your voters. So getting the ground game going, hiring up, there's a lot of recruiting going on right now for staff in the key states at the front end of these primaries, uh, getting the message tailored to those states. So part of your, your question about the tariffs, well, Iowa. Uh, I, how is that affecting Iowa? So we're going to see a lot more statements coming out of these candidates talking about very uh, narrow and specific issues that matter to the voters in those states. That's why ethanol always yeah. played a big role in uh, nominating contests. And so uh, I think we're going to see a dwindling down. The big, broad national conversation is going to start to shrink, shrink, shrink. Rashida, very quickly, I've got about 30 seconds. Looking at someone like Kamala Harris, she took a bit of a battering in the uh, debate. How does she retool her uh, message right now? I think she needs to be prepared to not only dish it out but take it and be able to respond to it. I was really surprised that she wasn't prepared last night. And I'm sure because of the, um, the type A, um, very intelligent, driven women that she is, she probably already is retooling her responses. And I think that she'll be ready for the next debate. Okay, and that's where we leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Anand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.